The Transdisciplinary Play-Based Assessment by Carly Nunn, Ashley Reichwin, and Cora Spiller. The author of the TPPA is Tony W. Linder, and the publisher is Paul H. Brooks Publishing Company. I'd also like to note that there is a second edition of this test available. However, in this presentation, we will be talking about the first edition. The transdisciplinary play-based assessment can be used with all children who are developmentally functioning between the ages of infancy to six years old. The TBPA is also conducted by a team, which includes the primary caregivers, such as the parents, and a professional who is knowledgeable about all areas of development. The developmental level, learning style, interaction patterns, and relevant behaviors are all analyzed. A main purpose of the TPPA is to observe the child in a normal play-based environment to assess if intervention is needed and how much intervention may be needed. The TPPA is a criterion referenced assessment. It is designed to observe the developmental status of cognitive, social emotional, communication and language, and sensory motor domains. Scoring looks at areas of strength in each of these categories, and the team members give a rating and justification for the rating given, and this scoring is subjective. The TBPA is designed to see what the child is ready for, and the examination of the child's performances in each category can help the team to determine the type and amount of service needed. One of the great things about the transdisciplinary play-based assessment is that it is very flexible to meet the needs of the child and the clinicians. One of the downsides for the TPBA is all the materials that are needed for the test. This test requires a child-friendly environment, probably like your typical preschool playroom. It requires a lot of specific types of toys. You need toys and areas to represent familiar places, like the home, the grocery store, a restaurant, to encourage common behavior and or problem solving. You will need the child to demonstrate behavior that they would normally perform in a familiar situation. Therefore, you will need to provide them with familiar situations, such as the ones that we discussed before. However, you may also present them with a new situation to see how they will behave with problem solving. You also need toys to represent people and animals to see how the child interacts with them. You would also want areas to build using blocks, Legos, and tools. You also need areas with art supplies to show manipulative skill, representational understanding, and fantasy play. In addition, you can use out-of-the-ordinary textures to test tactile responsiveness. Also, you need toys to test gross motor skills, such as tricycles, stairs, swings, balance beams, slides, etc. You'd also need a general area to test those areas not already observed, most likely using cause and effect toys, puzzles, pegboards, and other common items. There are a few categories of people that you will need to perform the test. First, you need a play facilitator who interacts with the child. Basically, you just need someone to play with them. You also need a parent facilitator who interacts with the parents. Then you also have observing team members. The team can be as many people as the parents deem needed for their child. It usually involves people such as an SLP, physical therapist, a psychologist, etc. You also need a video camera operator to film the session. This will be key in later stages of assessment. That way the team can go back and review everything that occurred during the test. One of the great things about the TPPA is that the test is almost totally customizable. The activities and the materials, the structure of the session, and the assignment of roles to team members can all be adapted. This means you can tailor it to the child and their needs. This also allows greater focus on the parents' areas of concern. Although it is very helpful to have the test be almost totally adaptable, it makes the scoring method very long and involved, since you cannot simply mark the child's actions as correct or incorrect. 
There are seven steps to scoring the TPBA. The first step is to schedule a post-session meeting. Preferably, you would schedule this right after the session. That way, it would be easy to meet with the parents. During this meeting, the clinicians and the other professionals would come up with examples of behavior they saw that fit categories of the TPBA guidelines. You would also come up with areas of concern and areas where the child showed strength. The next step is to analyze the videotape if it is available. During this time, each team member comes up with areas that they want to watch again and discuss later. The next step is to correlate observations and guidelines. This is where you further determine the child's strengths and you would use age charts provided in the test to focus on the areas that the test covers and get data for the child's age. During this time, you would discuss the developmental level of skills, the professional judgment of the quality of the behaviors, and you would also come up with a description of aspects of their behaviors or skills. After this, you would complete the summary sheets. This is the longest section of scoring. Each sheet has a column for major observation categories for each domain. It also has response columns for the observation category, such as the child's performance, you would explain the rating that you gave the child, you would explain the child's strengths and what they appear ready for, you would mark each one with a plus if the child was in the standard range, you would mark each one with a negative symbol if the child shows delay, deviation from normal behavior, or poor quality of performance. The negative sign shows need to examine causes of concern. If there is not enough information on an aspect of the summary sheet because of the lack of behavior, you would simply put a check mark. If the category is not appropriate for the child's age, you would mark with an NA. If you do not have the opportunity to deserve the behavior and you don't need to put the behavior down, then just put an NO. The next to last step is to convene a program planning meeting. This is a full team meeting with the parents where you would review assessment information, determine the eligibility for services, and plan intervention goals. You would examine the range of ability and the needs of the child and their family. You can use this test for an IFSP or an IEP, therefore this section would need to be greatly discussed. You would also complete a cumulative summary sheet after the meeting. You would summarize areas of strength and identify what all the team would work with with the child. The final step is to write a formal report. This will be the basis for program planning and intervention. This includes basic information on the child, the reason for referral and who referred them, their history, the method of assessment, the interpretation of assessment results, and a recommendation. Each professional involved contributes to the report. It also must be easy to read for parents, teachers, and any other people who would need to use this document to help the child. You would also have a meeting with the parents after it was made to discuss the report. Now that we have discussed general information, the materials and people needed, adaptions allowed, and the scoring method, Carly is going to discuss the six phases of the TPBA. Phase one of the TPBA is unstructured facilitation. This time should last about 20 to 25 minutes and the child will take the lead. The play facilitator will follow the child's lead by imitating the child's behaviors and vocalizations, engaging in conversation, and interacting with toys in parallel associative or cooperative play, depending on which is appropriate to the child's level of development. The child is free to move around the area and play however he or she likes in this phase. The play facilitator should pay close attention to the cues the child is giving through body language, interest, learning style, and patterns of interaction. Phase 1 can look like anything really because the child is the one taking the lead. Having kitchen or cashier toys in the area will help set the child up to use his or her imagination in this unstructured playtime. Phase 2 is structured facilitation. In this 10 to 15 minutes, the child should engage in cognitive and language activities that weren't observed in phase one. The child will be asked to perform spatial tasks like puzzles and drawing, cause and effect tasks, 
high-level problem-solving skills, and other developmentally appropriate skills. The facilitator will be more directive in this phase, selecting the tasks, requesting performance, and questioning when necessary. However, this phase should retain as much of the child-initiated play quality as possible, making the tasks seem like fun games. An example of what phase two could look like is if the child initiated playing teacher in phase one, it may be natural to move into a worksheet like this one in phase two. This I Spy worksheet will assess the child's matching skills. Completing it may still feel like it's a part of the playtime the child initiated during phase one, but the play facilitator now takes the lead in prompting the child to complete it. Phase three is child to child interaction. This phase, which lasts about five to 10 minutes, returns to the unstructured mode. This time, there will be another child present in the play environment. The primary purpose of this phase is to compare the child's interactions with another child. The play facilitator will still follow the lead of the child being assessed. However, if no interaction is taking place, the facilitator may initiate and reinforce interaction. Introducing toys that encourage interaction will be helpful, like telephones, balls, cars, and dolls. This phase allows the observer to observe play interactions, social patterns, cognitive, language, and motor behaviors. Different responses may be seen with another child than those seen with the adult facilitator. The facilitator should note these differences. Phase three is child directed, so the child being assessed should take the lead during this playtime. Having Legos or dolls in the play environment will be good toys to promote interaction between the children. Phase four is parent-child interaction. During this phase, the parents will be asked to engage and play with their children, individually if both parents are present. They will be requested to repeat the types of play activities they do at home. During this time, which will last about five minutes, the child's interaction with the parent is observed, as well as other skills and behaviors. During this brief period, the child usually interacts with the parent in the same way he or she does at home. The child may be more verbally expressive with the parent, so this may be a good opportunity to obtain a more representative language sample. After initial playtime, the parents will be asked to leave the room. The parent tells the child that he or she is leaving and will return in a few minutes. The child's emotional response and behavior during the separation is observed. When the parent returns, the child's response is again noted. Then the parent will be asked to participate in structured play. The task chosen should be unfamiliar and slightly challenging to the child. This time will reveal the child's response to the parent under a more stressful situation. The unstructured time in phase four should look like playing something familiar and fun, like using stuffed animals like ones the child may have at home. After the parent leaves and returns, a structured, slightly challenging task should be performed. A puzzle the child has never seen before or is slightly too advanced for the child may be a good task to use here. Phase five of the TPBA is motor play. This session should last about 10 to 20 minutes. The first part is unstructured with the facilitator following, encouraging, and sometimes initiating motor play on various types of equipment. After a few minutes of unstructured play, the facilitator will transition to structured play time, directing the child through activities that have not yet been observed. The motor therapist, if he or she isn't the play facilitator, may want to join for this phase to better observe the child's muscle tone, equilibrium, and other things. The decision to include the PT or OT will depend on the child's response to new adults. Different equipment may be used in this phase to observe movement, muscle tone and endurance, reactivity to sensory input, stationary play positions, mobility, motor planning, and other motor categories. To observe mobility, balance beams may be present for the child to balance, walk on, and hop across. The play facilitator may then encourage the child to slide to observe muscle strength as he pulls himself up the slide. The final phase of the assessment is snack. The child brought in for phase three may return for this time. During snack time, additional social interactions, self-help skills, adaptive behavior, and oral motor difficulties may be observed. Thank you for listening to our presentation. We hope you got to learn a little bit more about the transdisciplinary play-based assessment.